Greetings, I am Tom Earl. On this week's episode, we talk about disability awareness and making an impact with Katarina Rivera. Check it out. Woo! Nailed it. Greetings, I am Tom Earl. And this is my year of depth. We know you could be anywhere. So the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment, you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. As you can see, I am not alone. I have an amazing guest. She goes by the name of Katarina Rivera. What's going on, Katarina? I'm excited to be here, Tom. (laughs) <laughs> I am so grateful that, I mean, you're a, a sought after speaker. I'm sure you get DMs all the time that you are gracious enough to take this leap of faith, this random guy named Tom to, to be here with us. It, I'm just starting, I want to start off from a place of gratitude. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. So for the folks out there who might not know who you are, do you mind if I introduce you to them via reading your bio? Let's do it. We got the thumbs up for those on the podcast. Here we go. Katarina Rivera, MSED and MPH, is a public speaker and DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant with over 14 years of experience in the public sector. Katarina works with companies to improve accessibility and inclusion, retain employees, and design better products. She is the founder of Blindish Latina, a platform smashing disability stigmas through storytelling, advocacy, and trading. Katarina has worn hearing aids from a young age and was diagnosed with progressive vision loss at 17 years old. She has a BA from Duke University an MSED from Bank Street College of Education, and an MPH from Hunter College. She is a member of Respectability's National Disability Speakers Bureau. Katerina is committed to social justice. Yes, indeed. That's amazing. (laughs) So, Katerina, we always say, you know, a bio is amazing, and it's a particularly curated version of who we are. So if if you're willing to, if you if you feel comfortable, we our first question we always ask folks is a prompt. And it goes like this. If you really knew me, you'd know that. Hmm. That's a fun prompt. Oh, I guess if you really knew me, you would know that salsa dancing is life. I will get on the dance floor and you will not be able to find me, bring me back for as long as the music plays. Like that is my happy zone. And I do share online some some little dancing videos here and there. What else? Hmm. That I, as much as I'm polished and professional and ready to share my message, I'm also very goofy and funny in my private circle. I love that. Let, let's let's take it back to as far back as you'd like to go. When did you, did you know when you were growing up, I want to be a DEI consultant. I'm going to have two masters from the sounds of it. Uh, you know, did you, did you know, this is the passion, the pathway you were on? Did you see that when you were, uh, when you were coming up? No, I've really been open to the journey of life and my career has changed as my interests have changed as I learn more about the world. So the one thing that has been the common thread is that I've always wanted to have a meaningful impact on the world and follow a specific passion and purpose. At the same time, I was open to changing that because I don't know what I'm going to know in five years. I don't know that now. I don't know what I'm going to know next month. So I think that's really been amazing because there are people that are 
really set from a young age on a specific career path. Medicine comes to mind as one of those where if you're deciding on a career in medicine from a young age and you start that path, you're making a very long-term commitment. It takes so many years. And sometimes people finally finish all of that and it's not in line with who they are anymore. So I'm really glad that I had this approach of being open and focusing on the meaning behind all of my choices rather than a specific industry or title or just thinking that things had to be a certain way. I have so many follow-up questions. <laughs> I'm bookmarking them in my mind. So the first one, you know, having a sense of certainty and, you know, for a lot of people that can be, sounds stressful, not knowing where I'm going to be five years from now. I want to know the pathway. I want to be able to draw the line, connect the dots. How did you develop such a healthy relationship with openness and the uncertainty that may come with that? I wish that I had a recipe for all your listeners. Like, this is how you do it. I think um, there are some things that stand out to me. My parents, of course, were big influence on my life and my mother in particular. My mom is an entrepreneur and she is a CPA with her own business. Growing up, I was alongside her. I saw her in action. I saw her working with clients. I remember at one point when I was young, she started a nonprofit organization and I would go to the meetings and participate. It was for young people in our hometown. So um, one of the things that I'm not really sure where my comfort with uncertainty came from. But I do know that I started making decisions with my gut early on. And I think that when you do that, you put yourself on a path to being more open because you're checking in with yourself and you're saying, this is feel right. Or what am I thinking? And you're also open to what's coming in from around you. Like for example, when I applied to colleges. I applied to so many colleges. I had no idea. I ended up getting a scholarship to Duke University. And that was a clear sign of, okay, I'm going to lean into this. This is an external message that here's the path. Um, So, and that program that I was in, it was a scholarship program with every summer, it had an experience where we were focusing on leadership and volunteerism, but also kind of what it means to be a good citizen and learning about different places. So I spent my first summer in rural Appalachia in Kentucky, and I was 18 years old. I never even thought about what it would it be like to be in Kentucky. My second summer, I spent it in Argentina, and that was incredible to me because I had attended an Argentine Spanish school when my mother was really working hard to make sure my brother and I spoke Spanish, even though we grew up in the United States and were born here. Um, We went to school on Saturdays. And in that school, we learned um, from the Argentine curriculum. So I had learned like social studies and history and so many things. And then years later, I was actually in the country. So I think having experiences like that or also, oh, and on the third summer, I went to South Korea. I went to Seoul because I had a friend in the program. She said, let's do our internships in Seoul. Let's do this. And I think those experiences were really formative. I learned a lot. And I, I at that time, I thought my impact and my way of making an impact was going to be through education. So that's what I pursued immediately after school. And that's why I have my master's in dual language bilingual education. And the reason, or one of the reasons that I wanted to be an educator was because I wanted to give back to the Latino community or the Latine, which is a term that I'm learning about more. And this was really because my family had a lot of privilege and advantages. My parents both have master's degrees and we do have a strong history of immigration in our family, but we just 
by the time that I was born, it, it was they they had master's degrees. They had that kind of access. And this really impacted my life because when you're a parent of a child who's disabled, there are a lot of systems to navigate. And I can only imagine for families where the parents are Spanish dominant and um, are not able to navigate those systems as well, the challenges that can arise because the world is not accessible in so many ways. So I just felt a great sense of responsibility to do something with my privilege. And I ended up teaching in the Bronx under a program called Teach for America. And that was my first job. And it was amazing because I was working with bilingual education and I was teaching English and Spanish. And so all of my students were um, Latino. And some of them were recent arrivals and had recently immigrated. And some had been there for a few years and just really needed somebody to teach them well. So that was my first job. But I didn't know what being a teacher would be like until I was a teacher. So I think my recommendation to anybody is to be on a learning journey, be on a self-reflection journey and recognize that as freedom rather than something to be worried about or anxious about because you, I think, can live a bigger life, a more daring life, but it's not scary necessarily. It's more fulfilling. It's more exciting. That good kind of scary, maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how, how, so how many years did you do Teach for America? And, and what was your experience like? It was hard. It was hard. I was not used to telling somebody what to do and then enforcing it. I mean, that was just the hardest thing. Even though it was a class of third graders, they tested me so much. And um, I almost lost my job. I had some really tough moments where the principal said, like, are you going to get it together? Like, because I really want to keep you. But I can't walk by your classroom and see them on the floor. Like, you got to shape up. Um, And I had to hustle to improve myself and get mentorship, get it help. I taught in that particular school for three years. The Teach for America commitment is two years. Many people stay longer. Some people don't. And other people uh, stay longer in the educational field, but end up doing other roles and other things. So I ended up teaching overall for four years. And I could, I switched to another school, but What happened as I was teaching is that I noticed that my kids were eating a lot of junk food, a lot of processed food. And I was really concerned about it because it impacted their energy, their learning, their mood. And I will never forget, I had one student who had lunch with me. And that was a fun thing that I would do. I would invite them to have lunch with me, connect with them, build relationships. And she came into the classroom and opened up her lunch. And she was very proud of her lunch. And this is the thing that's complicated about it. The students were very proud when they could buy something from the store, when they had a little bit of money to do that. What she pulled out was two bags of Cheetos, one spicy, one not spicy, a sunny D and like a small little container of water. And that was her entire lunch. And I will never forget this. Because even though I had seen it and been seeing it, that there was a lot of this processed food and junk food, that moment crystallized it for me that I wanted to do something about it. Now that I was no longer in danger of losing my job, I could look at other things. And so that began my journey in terms of nutrition and holistic health and wellness, which is probably the path that the next chapter of my career journey, that's what it represented. I started to, as soon as I finished my master's, six months later, I did a holistic health coaching certification. And I started to think about how can I make an impact on nutrition? How can I work with families? So I eventually decided to quit teaching in order to start a community health program. And where I was living, which is Washington Heights and Inwood in Uptown Manhattan. And I started a program. I quit my job. And I was 20, I think I was 25. 
I had a little bit of savings. I thought I had a lot of money saved. I was like, I'm set. This is going to be great. But I had never done that before. But what I loved about it is that I had gotten into a graduate program at a very good school. And with a scholarship, my mother was like, yes, you're going there. And I said, actually, I might not. And I very consciously made this decision that I wanted to do something different. And I would not be able to live with myself with the regret if I did not start this program in my community and work on this idea. So that's the path that I took. But what I told myself is that, you know, I didn't have children. I didn't have obligations other than myself. I had a little bit of savings, as I told you. And what's the worst that could happen? I can go back and get another job. So I just chose to believe in myself and not live the path of regret. Mm, That right there, we could just say, I chose to believe myself and not live the path of regret. And then we just meditate on that for the rest of the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, before we move on, we're going to pick up the thread of your life here in a sec, but I just want to grab a couple points. What is the connection? Why? I mean, I'm going to be sarcastic. Okay. Like kids are kids. They can eat almost anything and be fine. Why were you so impacted by kids eating Cheetos for lunch, like what's the big deal? At a very basic level, I thought about what was I eating as a kid? My mom was cooking and she would prepare a snack for us for when we got home from school. And I loved my little snacks, apples with peanut butter, bananas with peanut butter. Those were some of the items on her rotating menu. And then I always remember we would sit at the dinner table and there would always be a meal. It wasn't necessarily Cuban food, but it was a, it's a home cooked meal. And I think that for me, when I saw what the students were eating, because it wasn't just chips and sugary beverages. Another thing that would happen is that every morning we would line up, each class had to line up in the yard before we entered the building. And the kids who had a, some money in the morning would have purchased perhaps like uh what were those things like a cinnamon bun kind of thing in a package or candy first thing in the morning spray bottle candy was a very popular one it it was like candy I don't know what it was made of fluorescent colors and you would see them oh yeah yeah give me some and they're spraying it into each other's mouth and then their tongue is blue all kinds of candies at eight o'clock in the morning So I think when you're day in and day out with kids, you see the connection between when they've had a lot of sugar, when they've had things that don't fill them up. Because the bag of Cheetos, two bags of little Cheetos, that's not nutritious. So children would be hungry, irritable, have lower attention span, have issues with their classmates. and not have enough energy to kind of show up for the full learning day. So that's, but there was a stigma associated with eating the school lunch. And that comes from that um, bias against like being seen as someone who is poor or doesn't have enough money to go and buy something from the store. So whatever your qualms are or issues are with school lunch, the school lunch was better than what um, a lot of them were buying from the store. And there were some families that like packed sandwiches and there were some different varieties. I don't want to come out here and say that all the lunches were bad in the Bronx. You know, it's just a reality that a lot of students did um, face. And when I first started kind of thinking about this and couldn't get it out of my mind, that was a sign to me because I could not stop thinking about it. I started reading articles. I started going to the store, just looking and seeing like what was happening. For example, the bodega on the corner, I went in there and I looked at their drink section. The water was on the floor in the corner. So you had to, you had to like do a yoga move to get the bottled water in this bodega. And they had a little rack with some produce and I think it was like plantains and maybe onions. It just wasn't 
um, a lot. And then I went to the supermarket in the neighborhood and found as well, like what is available here is not like what is available in my neighborhood. And so over time, I really started to understand more of the systemic issues that were at play. And I moved into the food justice and food sovereignty camps. But at that time, I was trained as an educator and I was focused on, okay, I got to teach these families. But that was part of my learning journey to move away from that and say, okay, I have to look at everything in context. And you shared two two words with us, food sovereignty, food justice. I think a lot of us can put together food justice, but I don't want to make any assumptions. Food sovereignty. Could, could you break those down for us? I will do my best. So food justice is mainly the idea that everybody should have equal access to healthy, affordable, nutritious food uh, that is culturally appropriate and relevant for their culture. And when you're talking about what's the difference between food sovereignty and food justice, the word sovereignty kind of communicates it. It's having control over your food system, where you're, the pathway of how food comes to you. So for example, one of the things that is a huge issue in the States has been the uh, land loss for black farmers where if you look at the data over time, there were way more black farmers in history than we have now. Although there has been a little bit of an increase that people have celebrated. But when people had a land with gardens or community garden or just somewhere available to them where they could grow their own food, then you're in command. You're you have a complete control over your food, how it's grown, how it comes to you. In our world, a globalized world, many of us don't have control over our food system, but we would have the money available to make certain choices. And not everybody has that. And that's by design. Another word that people use as well as food apartheid. And I don't feel that I have a definition at the ready for that, or I encourage people to look that up as well. Well, we appreciate the the definitions you've gave us and we're all fans of homework. So it's been assigned y'all, food apartheid, look it up, let's do it. (laughs) Okay, so let's pick up the thread. So you you had this opportunity to go to a, a big name school with a scholarship. You followed your gut said, I'm going to go to this other school. And you're also starting a community, what was the word you used? Community health clinic? It was a community health program. It was like a program that was grassroots where I had free fitness classes for kids. Then I changed it up and did like nutrition education and fitness. But I quit teaching. I quit my job, like no job. And I started this nonprofit program with no way to pay myself. So following in your mom's footsteps with the nonprofit, huh? Yes, I definitely did. (laughs) And it was, you learned a lot. When you have to make stuff happen, when you have to do your marketing and your fundraising and figure out how to even get people to come to your program, you learn a lot of skills really fast. So I had a great time doing it. I brought on interns. I worked with a lot of great people and I eventually grew the program a bit where I was partnering with a local nonprofit and we had received a grant together and I was able to hire people instead of having volunteers on the program. And that was really exciting. I felt like we were growing and everything was continuing on a beautiful pathway. But at the same time, a program like this can only do so much because the most the number of people that I was helping at the max was like 40 people. And when I looked at my neighborhood, I said, this impact is too small. Like we need to do more because it's not going to reach enough people. And it's a lot of work just to reach the 40. So around that time, that's when I said, I really need to look at the systemic factors. I need to learn more. I have to regroup. 
And I started to develop a game plan. I went back to work at a nonprofit. So I switched from education to nonprofit and I focused on health. And I started to switch to that and I got a master's in public health at the same time. So both of my graduate degrees I did while I was working. I did them at night. And it was really, really amazing. It changed my perspective. It gave me that foundational principles. So after that, my career was different. I was focusing. So the best thing for me was right when I was finishing grad school, I found a job and I got this job. And it was to be the community engagement manager for a food bank. But the position was for the neighborhood of Washington Heights and Inwood. So it was basically an opportunity to come back to my neighborhood, work in my neighborhood, and get paid to work on food security issues. So I was like, this is amazing. This is incredible. This is a job for me. Um, So that ended up working out really well. And I actually was able to start a food justice organization in Washington Heights and Inwood alongside community members. And the organization became a nonprofit. They started a community garden. People, like we just had so many amazing things happening in that garden. We had workshops. We had one committee member who has been with the group since the beginning is very passionate about the monarch butterfly. And so every year there's two volunteers to like grow butterflies and raise them and then release them. So in the garden, we would have these family garden days and inviting people from the neighborhood to come hang out with us. And all of our programs were bilingual, which was really important to me. But we just had so much fun when she would bring the butterflies and place them. She would put, I think, like a little bit of juice on your hand. And it was all we let the kids do this. So I wasn't releasing a lot of butterflies, but she would put the juice in their hand, the butterfly would sit there, and then it kind of like start moving its wings and then fly away. And oh, the kids loved it. Those are some great memories. But Yeah, we grew food and gave it out to the community. And that was awesome. We had a member who taught food preservation workshops, so kind of like pickling things, which was awesome. We did that in the winter every year. And I stayed with the group for four years. And I said, okay, guys, I'm going to be leaving because I didn't want to have founder syndrome. I didn't want to have a group that relied on me. Like they really needed to create a structure that could live without me, continue to grow and hold the vision themselves. So I'm proud to say that they are doing that. And I exited in October, 2020. What was that like? It was very meaningful for me because I felt that I had finally done it. I had left a legacy in my community that was going to make a measurable impact that I felt good about because the educational program that I had done years before was a nice program. But when I really sat down and said, okay, what's the long-term impact of this? If someone comes to my program for six weeks, it's not, it just wasn't enough. I didn't think it was that mm, groundbreaking, I guess. So knowing that the Washington Heights Inwood Food Council, or as we say, the Wind Food Council, is there, is sustainable, is community-led and community-driven. I just feel really proud and at peace, I guess, that I figured out what to do with this desire to give back to my neighborhood. What was it like to be running a community garden in New York during COVID? Well, I we took a lot of our activities online And so I think it was with baby steps because we didn't know what was safe and what wasn't safe in the beginning. So we did different things. Our members started propagating some of the seeds. That's probably the wrong word because I'm not the garden leader. (laughs) I'm not the expert on the garden. I'm the organizer. Uh, But yeah, they started growing the seeds at home. And then the 
plants got really big and we were not allowed in the garden because this is a garden that is run by another organization and we have a certain allotment within the garden. So they were not allowing anybody in there. So we had to arrange a plant drop off for everybody who had the plants that were getting really, really tall. We went at an appointed time, we placed them in front of the entrance and we left and we just, you know, waiting for confirmation that they got them and they were able to then put it in our plot. So we just had to get creative. And um, so then after a while, they started to open up and do smaller events like 10 people with masks. And what we, what we did and what people have always done is adapt to the situation and rise to the occasion. There was a community fridge that started in the neighborhood and providing free food. So we linked up with them when they started to do free distributions. Um, and so at the time that things were really opening up, I was out of the organization. So I've been watching them and seeing the amazing work that they've been doing. And it's gardening season again. So I love to just check in and see what's happening, what's growing. But they've really adapted and continue to cement and grow their relationship with the community members. And so then when did Blindish Latina, when did that enter the, the stage? Blandish Latina started in April 2020. I had been thinking about doing something, but like many people, I had an idea. I talked about it a little bit. It was on my mind, but I did not do it. And I don't know why I didn't do it earlier, but I always believe that things happen for a reason. Right before COVID hit New York, I was connected to a person on Instagram by a mutual friend. And I went on this woman's page. Her name is Mariela Paulino. Her page is Project Hearing. I went on her page and I saw that she lived in New York. And I was surprised. I didn't know that. She is a Dominican woman who has two cochlear implants now and is hard of hearing. So finding somebody else who was disabled and Latina and also hard of hearing like me was so cool. I got really, really excited. I wanted to meet her and I invited her to a happy hour that I was having that night in Midtown and fully expected her not to come. And she, on her side, she said that, she said yes. Then she brought a friend just to make sure that, because she had never met me before. She wanted to make sure that she was going to be okay. And like, I was a stranger. So it was really fun. Once we met, we had a really great time. And then when we left the event, we rode the train together and my partner was there too. And we said, oh, I ride this train. And she said, oh, I ride that train too. I said, okay. And then we found out we lived at the same stop. So I was like, this is bananas. No way. No way does this happen in New York City. So yes, her building was very close to mine at the same stop. And then we never, like right after that, COVID happened and we had to shut down. So I started to video chat with her. And it was so funny because I'm like, you're so close. You're so close yet so far. But she's very um, dynamic and passionate. And we eventually decided to start a conversation series called Chicas Talk Disability, where we wanted to talk about disability from the perspective of two disabled Latina professional women. And this was about representation, really, because a lot of times when you see who's out there representing disability, who are the media using to represent disability, who are they putting forward? A lot of times it's white men. We, and then when you're talking about, you're looking for a, a Latino person or a Latina person, it's really not so visible. So we wanted to be that representation and have interesting conversations. So I needed to start Blindish Latina in order to promote the event, the first event that we planned. So I said, okay, it's happening now. And that kicked me into gear. So I started all throughout 2020, we were hosting events. We hosted different conversations. One of the most powerful ones that we discussed or we hosted was about allyship with the black community and like how can the disabled community be an allyship and why we need it to be. 
We also had another one that was really powerful as well about police interactions with the disabled community. And people really shared stories, their strategies that were shared. So that was our thing. We wanted to talk about topics that we didn't see people talking about and bring those conversations to light. What changed for me was that I wanted to have more of an impact in terms of, and I wanted to have a business model. So at the beginning of the year, I changed my strategy with Blindish Latina. And I said, look, I know that I like public speaking. I've done Toastmasters. I had to speak every time that I was talking about my nonprofit program. I've led meetings for Wind Food Council. I've been a teacher. So let me lean into this. This is something that I kind of didn't see, but was there all along that I can talk and I can share my story. And now the other thing that happened for me was that I was really powerful in my disability identity. And Tom, I couldn't have done this if I wasn't where I am now in my disability journey. And not everybody comes to this place and that's okay. But I went from denial, grief, being upset, to acceptance, to self-advocacy, to saying, wow, I feel really strong. I need to impact more people with advocacy to public advocacy, which is what I'm doing now. So in that way, it was the right time for me in my life to step out and center my disabled identity way more strongly than I ever had before. So I started the business in January with just the beginning of research and figuring out what I wanted to do. I learned about a bunch of stuff. I learned Instagram. I learned LinkedIn. And um, then I did a formal launch in May. What was that like? What was the creating a launch, going through the launch? What were the ups and downs of that? Well, it's been, it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of work for sure. I think that um, ups and downs of a launch. I think for anybody starting something new, you have to affirm your value to yourself over and over again and figure out what feels right to you in terms of saying like, what I'm doing is needed and what I am doing is important and I am the person to do this. So I don't know how I got there necessarily, but I did put it in my daily affirmations that I say every morning. I did visualize myself on stages. I also don't come at this from a place of desperation or seeking money. And I think that makes a difference too, because I'm chasing impact. I'm also, I'm just living in my values. This is what's important to me. So by doing that, it's not like I need to, I, I have the belief that the right opportunities will come to me even because I'm doing the right things. So that I think helped with the launch. But yeah, the launch is a lot of work. I, I basically overbooked myself, Tom. I don't know if you do this. I made like, I said, I'm going to go live every day for two weeks and sometimes multiple times a day and it's going to be fun, right? I'm going to go live on Instagram, live on LinkedIn. I went live on Clubhouse. Yes. I did three Instagram lives. I think I did three Clubhouses. I went live on LinkedIn twice. No, it's four Instagram lives. And I had a separate event for my Stigma Smasher community, which is what I call the people who are on my Instagram. My blind is looking at Instagram. We're all Stigma Smashers. I had a special event just for them. I was finalizing a speaker reel, a video. This is now on my website. So I was debuting that, creating content, lining up all of my collaborators for the live events and <laughs> marketing all of that. And I also had to finalize my website, my newsletter service. I published an ebook, which is available on my website and for free downloads. I had to figure out the automations of a download. And select an email newsletter provider and work that out. So it's quite a lot. 
Yeah. When you said you launched, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> that that's what we do. If you don't, we, we, I run a Facebook ads agency. So we help people with their launches. So I was like, oh man, launching and, you know, by yourself or with a small team that I knew that was going to be a lot. So congratulations on, on launching and your content is fantastic. Well, well, I mean, your, your handles behind you. So for those on Instagram, blindish Latina, we'll plug at the end before we sign off where you can find everything, but your content is excellent, excellent, informative, engaging, entertaining, all of it is like the perfect mix of impact creating content. So I am grateful you you launched. What one of the questions that you keep coming back to is how can I make a greater impact? Where you're like, you're making an impact, you're like, I can do it even bigger. What does that reflecting upon that question? Is it a like over time? Is it an epiphany? Can you just talk to me about your relationship with that question? I can make a bigger impact. I would frame the question differently. I wouldn't say that I'm looking for a bigger impact in every scenario with the grassroots health program that I had started. Yes, I was looking for a bigger impact because I wanted to reach like a neighborhood level type of impact. Now I've changed arenas. So I am looking to amplify my voice and make a big impact with Blindish Latina, with my public speaking and my consulting. And I think what that really comes from is the fact that I'm ambitious and I believe in my voice. And I know that there are people who are not able to speak up for different reasons. Maybe they're not out as a disabled person. They haven't disclosed to their employer. Maybe they're newly diagnosed um, and they, they have to go through that journey. And I've heard time and time again that what I'm sharing is resonating with people. And so I feel like I have to do it for them and for the people that are going to come after us. I mean, there are young children being born, you know, next generation. If we don't create a more accessible world and inclusive world, they're going to struggle too. And that's one of the things that I truly believe about disability, that the, we need to move away from prioritizing the medical model, which says that the individual with a disability is the problem that must be looked at and must be treated or cured or worked on in a medical context. Whereas other models of disability, like the social model, say that, hey, like disabled people are just fine the way they are. And we actually need to change the world. We need to remove barriers. We need to be more inclusive. And that's where we need to spend our time and our energy because everyone benefits when we have a more inclusive and accessible world. It's that famous example that everyone uses. It's the curb cuts. And it's a very powerful example because people can understand it. So this a difference between the sidewalk that doesn't have a curb cut at the end and one that does, when you look at who's using it, it was designed for wheelchair users, but who's using it? People pushing strollers, people pulling luggage, someone who is delivering a package, an elderly person who can feel more sure about their step. It's everybody. So that's the, a really powerful example of accessibility and action that everyone can relate to and understand. And that's what we need to do. We need to take that lens and apply that to every aspect of our society and especially our digital world. Can I use it? Can I add on to that and use an example of an interaction between us that I, I think illustrates it as well? Go ahead. Okay. So you had emailed me and said, will you have closed captions on the Zoom? And I was like, well, now I now I will. <laughs> so I was like, of course. But I was like, oh crap, let me figure out how to do this. And so this is the first Zoom that I've had closed captions on. And when I watch TV, I have closed captions on because I, I can't necessarily understand what they're saying unless I have the volume turned way up. And as I'm using closed captions, I'm like, oh my God, this is like making this Zoom experience so much better for me 
now that they're on, I'm going to use them for, for everything. So I think that's, is, do you agree? Was that kind of the same thing of what you're saying that this benefits everybody? Yes. Yes. I'm giving a clap, giving the claps here. That's another great example. And so let's talk about closed captions. I'm hard hearing. People think the closed captions are for the hard of hearing and the deaf. That's who they're for, right? But when people like yourself and others are using captions, there are many reasons why. People might be distracted. People might have auditory processing disorder and it helps them to process information. And actually anybody would process information better if they're getting it in two ways, right? Captions and audio. It just makes the process easier of comprehension. Um, and there are people that, for example, when we're talking about captioning videos like on social media, there are situations in which someone doesn't want to put the volume up. It might be on public transportation or in the office. And so a captioned videos allows them to access the content without that volume. And there is data out there that um, people prefer captioned videos overall. And people are more likely to watch the whole video when it's captioned. Yes, cosign. I mean, we have all our clients capture their video, caption their videos before we run them as ads. So co-signing that. <laughs> That's great. So we, we've covered the story. I mean, as much as you can cover someone's amazing life in 40 or 40 or so minutes, with the time we have remaining, um, I'm wondering if I can ask you some questions that you, you probably get asked quite frequently about the you know DEI work that you do, but maybe for some of my listeners might be their first time. Is, is that okay with you? Sure. Okay. So my first question is in, you know, we're going to use a, a big loose term, diversity workshops that I went through, we were taught, they made a, uh, an emphasis of saying that we should use the word differently abled rather than disabled. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Who taught you that? Like, I literally want to know who taught you that? Was that a disability organization or was it an individual provider? It was a, so it was a, a program where we, we would spend the night for seven days and we would spend a full day on different aspects of diversity. And that one, people who had disabilities, so that I would assume they're from an organization, they were a team, came in and did the presentation. And that was what they, they taught us. And they taught us it multiple times. I, I went to this workshop like three or four times. Okay. For those who are not seeing my video, I am a guest. <laughs> and this is a real problem. Oh, I also... Tom, I never did a visual uh, description. This is actually something that I try to model for as an accessibility practice. So I'll just do it right now. So I'm a light-skinned Latina woman. I am. I have dark brown hair that's up in a top bun. Um, I'm, my face is very expressive. I'm looking right at the camera. I have uh, green earrings on and a polka dot sleeveless dress that's navy with white spots. And behind me is a backdrop which has the Blindish Latina logo, is a bold black eye and the Blindish Latina handle repeated multiple times and columns and rows. Should, so, should I do the same? Yeah, go ahead. Well, this is going to be fun. I am an extremely good looking uh, guy, white guy, uh, short hair, just got a real nice haircut. You, as you can see, I'm having way too much fun extremely you know nice haircut i got this really cool mic i'm wearing this really awesome flowery t-shirt that i wear for almost every interview and zoom call i ever do and then behind me i have this like tropical green flowery situation going on got a real nice watch and i'm very expressive with my hands and also with my face how was that that's awesome <laughs> good first time yes <laughs> That's a great accessibility practice and um, it's something I am trying to make standard practice. So thank you for letting me jump in there with my description. Now let's remember the question. Oh, differently able. Okay. No. <laughs> no. I, here's the thing. I'm going to break it down for you. When we use other words that aren't disability, differently able, handy capable, that's another one that's floating around. We send a subtle message 
that we shouldn't use the word disability. And what is that? Communicate to people that disability is bad. The word disability is bad, and it's not a bad word. There's nothing wrong with being disabled. Disabled should be a neutral word. And I completely understand that some people do not like the construction of the word disabled, but I would highly encourage them to focus on listening to disabled voices and to us, like listen to us. The community, the advocates in the past 10 to 15 years have said this was what we prefer, identity first language, and we want everyone to say the word disabled. We want to really focus on addressing stigma and ableism because unfortunately, a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about disability. They don't want to talk about it. And then what happens? They don't talk about it. Do they work on disability issues? Probably not. So then language becomes a barrier for people to get their rights to have their needs addressed, to be included. And this is a real dangerous practice. Now, one thing I always say about language is that as a non-disabled person, if you're a non-disabled person and you listen to this podcast and you say, oh my gosh, thank you, Katarina, for teaching me this. I'm going to use disabled, disabled, that's what we're using. And you meet a disabled person who says to you, hey, I'm differently able." Well, guess what? You better not correct them. You better not say, oh, I learned on this podcast. You can't, no, you shouldn't use that word to describe yourself. Is that, that's not your place. And me, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to respect what, however someone identifies. I'm still going to share my message. I'm still going to try to educate and help people to rethink the language they're using. But that's their decision. I'm not going to just respect their self-identification. So that is the way that I would communicate this. Um, there, if, if you're a person who loves to research, go online, look up Differently Able. You will find amazing writing from disabled voices who break it down, who say, this is not a word that comes from us. This word does not represent us. Well, I sure appreciate this conversation. This is helping me not to 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 keep using language then that isn't from the community. So I appreciate that. You had mentioned um, person first language. Could you break that down for folks? Sure. So there's a difference between person first language, which we'll use the phrase person with a disability. So you're putting the person first and identif- uh, emphasizing the personhood and identity first language, which would be saying disabled person, where the identity comes first. And there is a lot of conversation about what to use and what's right. Now, what we typically see is basically that organizations that focus on disability issues or nonprofits, large organizations are still using person first. They're saying person with a disability. And a lot of people in corporate spaces also feel like that is the right thing or that's what they're using. Now, why are they using person first? You have to look at the history. In the 60s and 70s, activists were calling for person first language because when you look at the history of the disabled community, people were shut out of society, institutionalized, not able, not allowed to go to school, no solutions made for access. For example, if a school had steps and you're a wheelchair user, there's a famous story that Judy Human, amazing advocate shares that she could not go to school because she wasn't a wheel, she used a wheelchair and the building wasn't accessible. And then that was it. She was kept at home. There was nothing, um, there were no rights as far as what could be done at that time. So when at the time, the desire was to emphasize that disabled people are people and their rights are part of human rights. 
and that was the big battle. And, and I really am grateful for the activists and the leaders that worked on this. In our society now, like I said earlier, there's just been a shift. You know, that was many decades ago. So now advocates really push for identity first language. And there are some very notable people in corporate settings who also are doing this. If you're just hearing about this for the first time, person first versus identity first, I think it's amazing that you're learning this from me, first of all. It's something that I encourage you to keep reading about. If you are at a company or an organization, I urge everybody to have a defined policy of what they're going to use internally and externally. So I think that's very important. The other thing that I recommend to everyone, if you have not seen it, is to see the documentary Crip Camp on Netflix. It's Oscar nominated. It's incredible at telling a very human and beautiful story where you get to know people and also contextualizing the disability rights movement. Cosign, super powerful, super, super powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think I think uh, the Obamas that there was one of their productions. Yes, it was. <laughs> That's awesome. So speaking of productions, you put out a reel, uh, I believe, on how blindness is a spectrum that is getting like millions of views, uh, and 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 awesome support, and also not so awesome support. Can can you can you share a little bit about that? Definitely. So this real is so surprising to me. This is my second reel that I ever created. It's 17 seconds. And if you go to my page, you can see it. But all that I say is that I use a white cane, but I can still see. And I act the part of somebody who doesn't know about this. So it's kind of goofy in that way. Then the next frame, I go like, how does that work? And then I'd say, well, people think that blind people see a pitch black world, but that's not the case because, because blindness is a spectrum. And then my favorite thing is the ending because I go, whoa. Um, so it's way better in the actual video, but I have done so much free labor responding to comments because, and this is my first time that anything has gone viral and it really brings a different cross-section of people. There are people that are so happy to learn something new and this like blows their mind and they're excited. They say, thank you. And I encourage them to keep learning because that's my whole mission to activate non-disabled allies and help. If people don't know someone with a disability, I want to be that person for them online, that disabled friend who's going to educate them, who's going to be a real person to them who's disabled. Um, I've also gotten exactly why I needed to make this video in the first place. I've gotten comments that accuse me of faking my blindness. And the very first line in my caption is stop accusing people of faking their blindness. So there's the whole comment section that focuses on things like that. And also saying that the word that I'm using is wrong. There's also people that are saying things that don't really make sense. Like they come on the video just to make a joke that they think is funny. But sometimes the joke is actually a harassment comment, which then after I've responded, they call it a joke. And it's not something that was funny. So the way it's been a lot to a lot of unexpected just types of people because my, my page and my community, the Stigma Smasher community has been very positive and very much uh, I've been able to get to know everybody who connects with me. So now my audience has grown a lot and I'm grateful to have so many people now also connected to me and following Blindish Latina, but also like I'm the type of person that I want to address the negative comments. 
I don't want to just leave them up there. And I'm trying to figure out my strategy. Like, what do I do? So I've been trying out a few different things and, and it's not a, it'll be evolving. I'm sure how I want to deal with it. But for some people I've been saying, thank you for showing why I need to make this video in the first place. You know, or like, there are also people that over and over and over ask me to explain more. And this is a post that has like over 900 comments now that I find it. I'm not sure how to interpret that because I have a page with almost 200 posts where they can learn more. They can go on Google and learn more. And also they expect the 17 second video to like explain step-by-step, step, like they're not understanding. Like, I, I don't understand. Can you explain more? And so, you know, I, I've started to just say, well, you know, look at my other content or, or look at the other comments because I have responded to hundreds and hundreds of comments here. And that's where you can learn instead of asking me directly again to explain. So I don't know, it's been very interesting. And I think the, that what I want to focus on always is the people that are hearing the message and are grateful for the message and are saying, I never imagined this about blindness. I wish I learned this in school. Like, why didn't anybody teach me this? Or I know someone who's blind or I'm blind myself and I get this all the time and people are so rude to me. Thank you for making this video. I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And I appreciate the content that you put out so much. The research that I was doing before coming on this interview, for, for those who are listening, where we might be on the, the privileged side of the spectrum, I my encouragement is it just makes you more aware. I mean, for when we started talking and I was talking about my green screen, I was like, I realized how much I use the word see as a descriptor. Like, oh, look at this, see this, see that, see that. And I was like, Oh, I wonder if this is like if I'm using if I'm setting an exclusionary tone in the space that we're sharing together. So it just it just makes me more aware of how I can be better at building a relationship, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that's wonderful that you're approaching it in that way. I do want to say for like saying stuff like. I'll see you soon or, you know, see you tomorrow. Like all of that is totally fine. There's, I've never heard any chatter about that being offensive language for blindness, but uh, we don't want to hear you saying like blind spot for, you know, anything other than a blind spot when you're driving, like, you know, or there's just a lot of phrases that people say without, um, realizing that it can be offensive. And of course, for other disabilities as well, like mental health has a lot of that. So crazy, insane, like definitely rethink your language, come up with other terms. But if you're just saying, you know, the one thing I would say is when you're talking to me and you say, as you can see, maybe I don't see, <laughs> you know? So just framing that in a question, maybe like if you're indicating something. This is what it is. Can you see it? Like, yes. <laughs> you know, Katarina, if you're if you're willing to after you reflect and you're like, I never want to see that guy again. Totally understand. But if you decide the the other way that, that this wasn't too bad of an experience, we would love to have you back. And now that we have the origin story, jump right in to going deeper on these conversations we're we're having right now. Would would you would that be something you'd consider? Let's do it. Let's get it scheduled. <laughs> and so for folks who, you know, where we've been talking about how awesome your, your IG is and for folks, a lot of folks, people who are thinking this, I'm thinking it myself that are thinking I, you know, for, for you, I hear that you do consulting. I'd love to hire you to help my, you know, my business, empower my business and the people that I work with, where can they go to, to find all of that kind of stuff? Yes. If someone wants to book me for public speaking, for my workshops or trainings or consulting, they should go to my website. So KatarinaRivera.com or KatarinaRivera.com in Spanish. And I have a connect page on there where you can submit an inquiry. The If you're a person who just wants to see my content and connect with me, then I'm on LinkedIn. 
I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Clubhouse at Blindish Latina. And I'm on Twitter, but I don't use it that often. So hit me up on my other channels. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that one of the great things about everyone, and you can feel free to edit this out, but like, I'm surprised when people come to me from Instagram, because as a business owner, I never thought that Instagram would be a way to get a corporate client or a public speaking or training. I thought that lives on LinkedIn. That only happens on LinkedIn. But I have had many people come and, you know, they fill out my connect form and they say that they found me through Instagram. And so I love that. And that really was something unexpected for me. I'm going to show this clip to all of my clients who are like, my clients don't live on Facebook and Instagram. I don't want to run ads there. I want to run ads on LinkedIn. I'm like, everybody is on Facebook and Instagram, right? <laughs> so I, I, I co-sign. I like that. <laughs> so show notes for those of you who weren't able to write that all down. Um, TomEarl.me slash C Katerina R. Riviera. TomEarl.me slash C R is where you're going to find all of the links or just below wherever you're listening to or experiencing or watching this right now. Katerina, this has been mind blowing. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for having me. And just to make sure that people are typing Rivera. No, it is R-I-V-E-R-A, Rivera. Did I say Riviera? (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. Look at this joker. Katerina Rivera, y'all, do not pay attention to the fool on the left. I am so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Tom. I appreciate this conversation and just the level of listening and empathy that you brought here. It's my honor. Our closing ritual is for you to share an invitation with those who are listening. So what would you like to invite people to think about, to consider, to research, to evolve into, to reflect upon, what is your invitation? I think my invitation will be for everyone to rethink your assumptions of others, especially in public. There have been many times when people think that I'm rude or I'm ignoring them and I wear hearing aids and I have very little vision, but they don't know that about me if I don't have my cane with me, if they don't see my hearing aids. So the assumptions that you're making out in the world that are negative, you actually don't know what's going on with that person. So I invite you to rethink and reframe your assumptions of others to be positive. I love that. What a great note to end on. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And to all of those who are listening or watching, as always, we're wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh, one one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching.